This is Untangled, fly fishing for everyone. Presented by Ventures Fly Company. Tell you what, folks, it is not all that fun getting old. Now, see, I say that. I say, ah, it's no fun getting old. And I get a little bit of grief for it because I'm not, quote unquote, old enough. Uh, But I'm older than I was a year ago, and I can tell a difference in in what life was like a year ago to now. And so I reckon I'm I'm entitled to be able to complain about getting old just because I'm not quite old enough, I guess. I don't know what that means, but it's what's been on my mind as uh, the weather's warmed up here a little bit and uh, things creak and hurt a little bit more as I'm making my way back and forth to the river. But that is neither here nor there. I should probably just quit complaining a lot less. I would probably be the move here. <laughs> Anyways, welcome to it, folks. This is Untangled, and I am your host, Spencer Durant. We've got a wonderful show lined up for you. I'm really excited about the topics we're going to get into, but before we get into topics, just a general reminder, if you have any questions about fly fishing that you would like answered at all, please, 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 please send those questions in to us. There's a link in the podcast description. Uh, there's a link in our weekly email that goes out. There's links all over our websites, our social media, anywhere that you find VFC, there is a link, there is a way for you to get a hold of us to ask us your questions. So please send them on in. That'd be great. Uh, today's show, we're going to be talking about tippet ratings, uh, like the pound test ratings, talking about line dressing, and no, that is not a weird, funky salad dressing, and we're going to be talking about dry fly rods. So, this is a great way to spend your Wednesday, uh, if you ask me. <laughs> it's a great way to spend any day, but especially Wednesdays, because that's podcast day, right? Oh, and one final thing before we start the show today. Please remember, episode 16 is coming up, right? That's the big one. The entire VFC crew is going to be sitting down in front of our microphones, in front of the camera. You get to see our beautiful mugs. We're going to be talking shop. We're going to be answering questions surrounding fly tying and we're going to be debuting some new products. So you definitely do not want to miss episode 16. There's going to be some fantastic stuff there for you. So please, please make sure you do not miss episode 16. Anyways, let's jump right into it. Our first question comes to us. uh, Dustin from Southwest Michigan. Dustin says, I'm new to fly fishing and I have a couple of questions for this show. How can small diameter tippet catch fish larger than the rating of tippet in pounds? How can I fish a river that is 20 feet deep or more with a 9-foot leader, tippet, and floating line? Thank you for all that you're doing for new fly fishermen that are trying to learn. Hey, Dustin, thank you for being a new fly fisherman, coming to us, and helping the show go around. I appreciate it. And this is a, you got a couple of really good questions here. We're, I, I want to start off by explaining what exactly a pound test rating means for fishing line, I think that's going to answer your question a little bit better. Yep. So when you buy any fishing line, if it's a fancy schmancy spool of tippet, which is just a fishing line, all right? That's all tippet is. It's just fishing line. We just have a really fancy name for it, okay? Uh, so whether you're, whatever you're buying, if it's a fancy spool of tippet that's $18 or that cheap $6 spool of Berkeley Vanish, uh, you get a pound test rating on that. Now, our tippet sizes also give us a size like 4X, 5X, 6X, but they all have a pound test rating. What that pound test rating refers to is how much weight can be applied to that line before it goes ahead and breaks, all right? So uh, take a look at our 6X Super uh, 6X Super Flex plus tip it here at VFC. It's rated for 3.3 pounds. That means that if you tied the line onto a 3.3 pound brick and lift it up, the line theoretically wouldn't snap because that's the pressure it's going to take to break it. Uh, if you try to lift a three and a half pound brick though, the line would go ahead and snap. So that's all your pound test is referring to. It doesn't have anything to do with the size of the fish that you're catching at all. It has everything to do with the amount of weight it takes to break that particular 
piece of fishing line. If a five pound trout only exerts two pounds of pressure on my tippet, I can land it on my 6X tippet just fine. It's all about how much pressure that trout exerts, right? It's like, how much pressure did my mother-in-law exert on me to not get Chick-fil-A for our wedding? A lot. Did we get Chick-fil-A for our wedding? You're freaking right we did, okay? (laughs) Pro tip, if you're planning a wedding, have Chick-fil-A cater it. Everybody's going to love you, and the leftovers that you get, oh, second to none, all right? Now, uh, hopefully that makes sense about the pound test rating, okay? Now, when we're reeling a fish in, we're not going to be lifting the fish in the same sense that we're lifting the brick from that earlier example, right? And a fish might weigh five pounds on dry land, but in the water, it's going to be a little bit more weight neutral, right? Because fish are, their support, their weight supported by the water. That's how aquatic animals work. So uh, if that five pound fish exerts all its force and power to run away from you, though, that could be quite a bit of pressure. What that pressure is, I don't know. I'm not a scientist, right? I don't even play one on TV. I'm just an English teacher by day who podcasts by night, all right? <laughs> that's that's what I do. So I'm not sure how much force a five-pound fish can put on you, but let's say, let's say that five-pound fish can generate three pounds of force. You're going to be fine with 5X tippet. Okay? It's not going to break it. And you're going to be able to land a fish that weighs more than what your pound test rating is on the tippet or fishing line, whatever it is that you're trying to use. So um, an example of how the size of the fish doesn't always correlate to the amount of pressure that it exerts. Uh, I think it was two summers ago. I was still living in Utah, so as longer than that. I was still living in Utah, and I went up to check some lakes the, the ice had just come off of them, and fishing's fantastic at those lakes when the ice comes off. But I got in there, and it had been a really wet spring, and the feeder streams had turned the lake into chocolate milk. I've never seen that happen before. The whole lake was just a muddy mess. So I was like, well, I'm not going to fish this anymore. So I start driving home, and I had to pass a big reservoir on the way home, and this reservoir is full of splake. Splake's a cross between a brook trout and a lake trout. And they're pretty good eating, and early in the year, you can catch them right close to shore without too much work. So I said, I'm going to stop. I'm going to catch a few splake for dinner, bring them home, put them in the frying pan. All is going to be great. So I parked the truck. I grabbed whatever rod I had rigged up with, like, 5X tippet, and I just threw a little uh, a little black marabou jig on. Uh, nothing, nothing fancy, right? Just enough to get out there. I knew where the splake where I was going to catch him. It wasn't going to be an issue. And I throw it out there and I see the weirdest thing start to happen because there's just these clouds of minnows that are just darting towards shore. I'm like, what's going on? Well, come to find out there was some tiger muskie on the prowl. The tiger muskie are a cross between a muskie and a pike and they're very popular in Utah. And these tiger muskie were herding these bait fish into the shore, stunning them on the rocks and then just eating them as they were sitting there, like, knocked out from hitting the rock, right? It was a real wild E coyote uh, roadrunner type situation that was going on. And one of those daggum uh, tiger musky went ahead and ate my little marabou jig. And like I said, I think I had, like, 5X tippet on, so I'm sitting there like, okay, well, I'm going to lose that fly and lose this big tiger musky. I was kind of bummed about that. Well, uh, about... <laughs> longer than I want to admit, I actually ended up playing that fish landing it, right? It was a 35-inch tiger muskie, weighed probably, I don't know, 8 to 10 pounds maybe. I, I, I don't know. It was about 35 inches long. I know that. And it didn't break the tippet, didn't break the line because it, it never exerted that much force on the line. So long story short there with that example is – it doesn't matter the pound test rating of your uh, of your tippet or your line. What matters is how much force that fish exerts on it. And that's what's going to determine if you snap your line or not. Now, the second part of your question here, Dustin, and I'm getting long in the tooth, so I'm going to try and wrap this up. Uh, the key to fishing deep, uh, deep rivers is to tie on more tippet to get your flies down to where they should be. 
right? For example, at the end of my nine foot leader, if I'm fishing my usual three nymph rig, I'm going to tie on my first nymph. Then two feet below that, I'll tie on my second nymph. Two feet below that, I'll tie on the final nymph. So you're already at 13 feet deep at that point. So if you need to get even deeper, you just add more tippet before your first fly. I will link a story about rigging up nymphs in the podcast description as well. So hopefully that makes sense. If you need more clarification, please reach out and I'll be happy to help you out uh, with that. So thank you very much for the question. I learned to fly fish when one night there was a lightning strike that hit the tip of my fly rod. And as I was dazed trying to recover from that moment, there was a vision in which the fly fishing spirit that inhabits all of us came to me, looked me in the eyes, and in that single look, all of the information I ever needed to know about fly fishing was transmitted. And when I came to back here in the real world, I knew what to do, I knew how to fly fish. There was no learning curve, it was instant, it was immediate, it was wonderful, it was ethereal. It was almost too good to be true. Now, if you aren't lucky enough to get struck by lightning and visit the fly fishing spirit face to face as I was, then you probably have some questions about fly fishing. That's totally normal. That's the way everybody learns this wonderful sport. So if you've got questions, please submit them to the podcast. We would love to answer them here. There's a link in the podcast description. You could also get a hold of us anywhere on our website to submit questions. So please go ahead, give us those questions, and we'll help you crush that learning curve. Our next question comes to us, uh, Scott from St. Louis says, I have questions about line care. Should I use line dressing? If so, how often do you dress lines? I have two great local fly shops, but both have given me different answers. One said they never use it, and the other uses it after every trip. Also, when storing reels for extended periods, do you recommend taking line off of the reels? Thank you for putting out such fun and informative content. I've really enjoyed it so far. Oh, Scott, (laughs) you're too kind, but thank you. I really do appreciate it. (laughs) Oh, Scott, this is a good question, actually. And for those of you who don't know what line dressing is, it's a very specific, very fancy kind of salad dressing only for fly anglers, all right? You can only get it at upscale fishing lodges, all right? Not just like your podunk little like two-star fishing lodge. No, you got to go to like a five-star fishing lodge. Okay, you order the salad and you say, I want some line dressing on that salad. The waiter knows what you're talking about. They'll bring it out to you. I promise, all right? And when everybody else sees you with the line dressing in there, everybody's going to turn and say, oh, yeah, they know what's up. You get instant river cred by doing that. And who doesn't want more river cred? Come on. (laughs) Okay. Kidding aside. All right. Line dressing. For those who don't know, line dressing is just, it's another fancy term for a type of cleaner that you can apply to your fly line. The goal of using line dressing is to get rid of any dirt and grime that builds up on your fly line over a long period of fishing. And as Scott found out, there are folks who use it religiously like after every time they're fishing, and those who don't. Surprisingly, every single major fly manufacturer suggests you use it, and they conveniently make their own line dressing. Isn't that just nice? (laughs) Right? To give you an example, Scientific Anglers says of line dressing, and this is a quote, Lines float because they are lighter than water and because they are hydrophobic. They repel water. For lines to float their best, both of these features need to be working. The density of your line won't change, it won't absorb water and become waterlogged and sink. But if it gets dirty, it won't repel the water well and it will float lower in the surface tension and may get pulled under now and then. The key to good flotation is keeping your lines clean so the hydrophobic surface can work. Cleaning with soap and water on a cloth removes most of the dirt, but our new cleaning pads work even better. Properly cleaning your lines will float better, cast better, and last longer. Certainly a good trade-off for a couple of minutes of line maintenance. Gee, 
Scientific Anglers, thank you so much for making a product that you say we need. I, I really just tip my hat to you guys for that. Yeah, kidding aside, I love SA. They make great stuff. It just, you know, it, it's fun to poke fun at the commercialization of fly fishing, right? Right? Okay, maybe not. Maybe I'm the only one who finds some joy in that. If you enjoy it too, let me know, though. So I know I'm, uh, I like to get to know the audience a little bit with some of these jokes. So, uh, Scientific Anglers recommends cleaning your line every two to three trips. And I'm going to be completely honest with you. I've never cleaned a fly line. And that's probably why I go through them so quickly. I do fish like around 150 days a year. So I figure I'm going to burn through a lot of lines anyways, but I could probably save myself a ton of money by cleaning those lines in the first place. I've never done it, but it would probably be something worth doing. Uh, I think it's a good habit to get into, and it there's no question it's going to help extend the life of your fly line, which is useful since you know we're spending up to 120 bucks on the really nice fly lines these days. You're going to want to protect that investment. That's not chump change, right? Uh, as for storing reels with line on them, the second half of your question, that's not terribly necessary with modern fly lines. You needed it with like your old silk lines and some of the really first PVC lines that came out. I don't personally take my line off my reels before I store them, but if you take the line off of the reel and store it differently, it's going to help reduce memory, which is how coiled and tight that line is when you're pulling it off uh, of the reel. And it'll probably increase the lifespan a little bit if you take the fly line off of the reel. There's a great article uh, over in MidCurrent about this, and I'm going to go ahead and link that in the podcast description as well so you can get another point of view on this topic. But that should wrap it up. I really appreciate the question, Scott. Thank you. And just like that, our time together today is coming to a close, but not before we have one more question to get to. So thanks everybody for sticking with the show. Really, really appreciate it. This last question is from Jeff in Utah. He says, I want to buy a dedicated dry fly rod. I can take to bigger rivers, but can also double as my small stream rod. I was thinking something like an eight foot three weight or four weight rod. I am in college currently, so I can't break the bank. I currently have a nine foot five weight rod. Do you have any suggestions on this topic? Also, brand suggestions would be great as well. Jeff, you're in college. Now is the time to make irresponsible financial decisions that will stick with you for the rest of your life. Don't you see what everybody else is doing? Use some of that student loan money. Go buy yourself a custom bill oyster bamboo fly rod. You'll be glad you did. Uh, And this is probably a good time to uh, state that I am not a financial advisor at all, and I'm not qualified to give any kind of advice like this. So please disregard any tongue-in-cheek comments like that one. Oh, Jeff, in all seriousness, thanks for the question. I love any and all opportunity to talk fly rods. That You know, I love it. And when you do get out of college as a graduation present, if you really do love dry fly fishing that much, look into getting yourself a bamboo rod as a graduation present. You'll be glad that you... Did I, I promise they are the best? I build bamboo fly rods, I love them, they're just a ton of fun to fish. I mean, it's hard to beat the versatility uh, of graphite, but there's just there's a soul to bamboo that you don't get in graphite, I think. So, uh, for what you're describing though, the kind of fishing that you're describing, I'm thinking that an eight and a half foot four weight sounds like a really, really good rod for you. Three weights. I'm kind of I'm kind of on an island with three weights. They're usually just too light for anything other than small stream fishing, so they're not as versatile as a four weight. And that's something that I've really come to value in my fly rods more over the years is versatility. I want the rod that can can switch to a nymph rig if they're down eating nymphs, go over to dries in the middle of the day if they're hitting dries. And, you know, on, on in some instances hit uh, smaller streamers as well. That That's what I'm looking for in a fly rod. Now, if you want a smaller stream rod that's mostly dedicated to dry flies, why wouldn't you go with a three weight? That's a good question. Well, three weights just don't have the backbone that a four weight does. And when you're throwing 
hoppers or cicadas or any big terrestrial or even just big dry fly patterns, that three weight's going to struggle just a little bit more. That four weight's got the backbone, especially if there's any wind, to help you get your flies where they need to be. Uh, in the hands of a good caster, that eight and a half foot four weight is kind of that's your that that's your do it all. If you had to pick one dry fly rod for the rest of your life, an eight and a half foot four weight is really tough to beat uh, from a versatility standpoint. So you look at it that way. You can fish your bigger hoppers, your bigger nymphs, and some smaller streamers on that four weight. It's just a little tough to do that on a three weight. Not impossible, just a little bit tougher. Uh, you know, last summer I was fishing cicadas on my two weight and that was fun, but it was a pain in the butt to cast because that bug was so much bigger than that fly rod was ever really designed to handle. So that's something else to take into consideration too. It's not only when you go down in line weight sizes for fly rods, are you getting a softer, more delicate rod, but you're also limiting the size of flies that you can really throw with any semblance of enjoyment in, in the casting. So, and I, I know some folks come to me and say, oh, well, I fish the seven foot three weight all the time on the North Platte. Okay. Uh, cool. I, you, you could really be more effective with uh, a, a bigger rod. So th- that's, that's why I'm telling you that eight and a half foot four weight is going to be a good bet. Now, why eight and a half instead of eight? Well, you get an extra six inches of reach, which is hugely helpful for high sticking or if you're making uh, mends across complex currents. Shorter rods can be a little bit tougher to mend with. And if you want to fish your new dry fly rod on some larger water, you want all the extra help in line with line control that you can get. And a good eight and a half foot rod is going to do that. I've got an eight and a half foot five weight Tom Morgan uh, that was built for me right before Tom Morgan died. And that eight and a half footer is as versatile as any of my nine footers. Uh, I lose the reach, but it, it's just a sweet little rod. And that's what I'd recommend uh, if you're looking uh, to get something that's going to tick all those boxes off. I'd recommend that eight and a half foot four weight. Now, with all that out of the way, the Orvis Clearwater, eight and a half foot four weight. That would kind of be my go-to, honestly. 250 bucks, so I, that shouldn't break the bank. That Clearwater series of rods is fantastic. I'm a big fan of what Orvis has done with them. They're just good rods. I've used them for guiding. I've used them myself in my own fishing. I just think Orvis did a really good job with that series of rods. Now, if 250 is just stretching that college budget a bit much, uh, you know, if you'd have to eat ramen for two months instead of one month to afford it, uh, then take a look at the Reddington Classic Trout. They also make an eight and a half foot four weight. It's 170 bucks, and it's kind of a cult favorite uh, for folks here in the West. So thank you for that question. And with that, we are done for the day. Thank you to everybody who stuck with the episode all the way through to the end. If you've got any questions at all about fly fishing, please don't hesitate to submit those questions here to the podcast. That's what keeps this machine well-oiled and running, right? That's what keeps these wonderful blend of really bad dad jokes and English teacher jokes delivered to you with fly fishing flair every week. And who doesn't want, I mean, if you're not laughing with me, at least you're laughing at me. So at least you're laughing at the end of the day, right? Well, in all seriousness, thanks, folks. Appreciate you. And until next week, tight lines.